Hello, AP Stat students, and welcome back to AP Daily Live Review. I'm Mr. Starnes, glad to see you once again. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Wilcox uh, spent quite a bit of time introducing you to the logic of inference, but he focused on inference for categorical data. So that leaves one big piece for us today to talk about, which is inference for quantitative data. So we need to talk about inference for means, and we need to talk about inference for slopes. For session three, uh, the materials for our session, as always, will be available at this tiny URL, tinyurl.com slash AP Statistics 2021 review. And what will you find there? The session four handout, that's the one that you want for, for this session, and also a copy of the formula sheets and tables, which we'll be accessing at a couple of points in the session. Another important resource we'll be using today is the graphing calculator. I will be using the TI-84 uh, on my side. You are welcome to use whatever uh, calculator you're planning on using for the AP exam. Uh, I encourage you to play along. And also a reminder at the end of the session, we'll be asking for your feedback on a Google form. Uh, just like to know what's working well for you and also to get any uh, suggestions you might have to improve our future sessions. So I hope you'll go ahead and access the handout. It has some links in it that'll be useful as we work through some of the multiple choice questions. I wanna take a minute before we jump into today's uh, content and address some feedback that we received after the second session. So one question we received, is the formula sheet that was in the Google Drive the same as the one that we're going to have on the actual AP Stats exam? Yes, it is. So you'll have practice working with the formula and table sheet in its exact format. Uh, another thing uh, that we heard from a couple of students was, I wanna know a little more about using my calculator. So, you should tune in uh, for some more on that in session five, where Mr. Wilcox is gonna talk specifically about calculator skills. Another question, is it possible to get more information about what needs to be included in a free response answer? Well, Mr. Wilcox did a wonderful job in the previous session about what you need to include on a free response question involving a confidence interval. I'm gonna do the same today for an inference question involving a significance test. And then in all of session six, I'll be including details uh, of what's needing to be included in a free response answer to get full credit. A warm fuzzy that we got uh, out of all three AP Live reviews I watched today, I definitely like yours the best. It clearly explained each problem solution. So shout out to whoever gave us the warm fuzzy. And uh, one more warm fuzzy, uh, being able to answer live is really nice. And I'm keeping an eye over there. Some of you are already answering live, so uh, you're a little bit ahead of me. But uh, uh, we, we're going to encourage you again to answer live on the multiple choice questions uh, that we'll go through today. Uh, in a computer output of least squares regression, what do the other numbers in the table and below that mean? Uh, that's a really, really good question. And I'm going to address part of it with a multiple choice question in this session. And then we're going to do a little bit more in session six with a free response question. Uh, and finally, I don't want to forget, happy birthday to Mr. Wilcox. Uh, I wanted to let him know that I can still remember being 42. Hope he's, hope he's enjoying himself. Probably he's watching, watching this session. So what are we going to learn today? Well, as in our previous sessions, the plan is to work through some multiple choice questions from previous AP exams. These questions have been deliberately chosen to highlight traditionally challenging content and uh, then we will move to a free response question from a prior exam that helps you develop important skills in doing inference for quantitative data. Our same goals, simplify challenging content. Along the way, share some strategies for AP exam success. And as always, try to build your confidence uh, as we work through these sessions. So let's do it. Let's practice. I'm going to put up the first multiple choice question. Uh, there is a response link in the session four handout, or you can go directly there using this tiny URL at the bottom of the screen. So I encourage you to do that because I'd like to see what you're going to put, put in response to this, uh, this question. And then we can address 
any misconceptions that uh, may emerge. So let me uh, practice what both Mr. Wilcox and I have been doing and read actively. So we have a random sample of 50 students at a large high school resulted in a 95% confidence interval for the mean number of hours of sleep per day of 6.73 to 7.67. Which of the following statements best summarizes the meaning of this confidence interval? So as always, this is my reminder to pause myself uh, and encourage you to respond via the response link. I'm gonna read through the answer choices and then I'm gonna give people an additional few seconds to decide which one is the best option. So which of the following statements best summarizes the meaning of this confidence interval? Choice A, about 95% of all random samples of 50 students from this population would result in a 95% confidence interval of 6.73 to 7.67. Choice B, about 95% of all random samples of 50 students from this population would result in a 95% confidence interval that covered the population mean number of hours of sleep per day. Choice C, 95% of the students in the survey reported sleeping between 6.73 and 7.67 hours per day. Choice D, 95% of the students in this high school sleep between 6.73 and 7.67 hours per day. And choice E, a student selected at random from this population sleeps between 6.73 and 7.6 hours per day for 95% of the time. So I'll pause there and give people just a few more seconds to lock in your answer. And then we'll start going through the solution. All right, got quite a few answers coming in and the majority have the same answer, but it's a bare majority. That's all I'll say. So I'm gonna use one of the strategies I mentioned in my previous session uh, that Mr. Wilcox used also in session three, and that is to try to anticipate the answer. We're asking about the meaning of a confidence interval. So the question I would ask back to you is, do you think we're interpreting the confidence interval or do you think we're interpreting the confidence level? I'm not sure from the way that they uh, asked the question, uh, but if we're interpreting the confidence interval, that's kind of a template that a lot of you have learned it would go something like we are 95% confident that the mean amount of sleep per day for all students at this large high school is between 6.73 and 7.67 hours. So if we saw that, we would know that we're just interpreting the confidence interval. Well, unfortunately, I've read through all those choices and we did not see that interpretation. So that means we're interpreting the confidence level. So a confidence level interpretation has to do with if you repeated the data production process, in this case, the random sampling, many, many times, what percent of those times would the interval you got capture the truth? So if you were to repeat, repeatedly random sample 50 students from this large high school over and over and over again, and each time you did that, build a 95% confidence interval for the mean number of hours of sleep per day, what percent of all those intervals would capture the truth? That's the idea of a 95% confidence level. So unfortunately, this is the one that's the harder one interpreting the confidence level and it's why I picked it. So all of the last three answers have nothing to do with repeating the data production process of random sampling repeatedly. They're talking about 95% of the students in the survey or in the high school, uh, or an individual student, 95% of the time, confidence intervals don't tell you about individuals in this course. They tell you about, in this case, the mean or the average uh, sleep time in the population. So that gets us down to A or B. Well, A suggests that 95% of all the random samples of 50 students would result in a, the confidence interval we got here. Now the confidence intervals would vary from one random sample to another, so it looks like answer choice uh, B is gonna be uh, our best option. Well, let's see how we did uh, on this question. Let me just share, uh, share some results. So for those that have answered, uh, it looks like just the majority, 50.6% as of right now, uh, 
put answer choice B, well done. This is not an easy question. Interpreting confidence level has been traditionally difficult for students over the years. Uh, so I'm happy with more than half. That's terrific. So let's keep it up. If this was my uh, hard question that I like to start with, then uh, maybe we're in good shape. So let's go to question two. And as before, you can answer using the response link in the handout, or you can go directly to this tiny URL and get to the Google uh, form that way. So we'll practice our active reading. A medical doctor uses a diagnostic test to determine whether a patient has arthritis. A treatment will be prescribed only if the doctor thinks the patient has arthritis. The situation is similar to using a null and an alternative hypothesis to decide whether to prescribe the treatment. The hypotheses might be stated as follows. H naught, the patient does not have arthritis. H A, the patient has arthritis. Which of the following represents a type two error for the hypotheses? Okay, so I'm boxing type two error, that's clearly important. And I'm putting up my pause button to remind me to give uh, everyone a little bit of time uh, once I read through these options. So which of the following represents a type two error for these hypotheses? Choice A, diagnosing arthritis in a patient who has arthritis. Choice B, failing to diagnose arthritis in a patient who has arthritis. Choice C, diagnosing arthritis in a patient who does not have arthritis. Choice D, failing to diagnose arthritis in a patient who does not have arthritis. And choice E, prescribing treatment to a patient regardless of the diagnosis. I'm gonna pause for a few seconds to let everyone lock in your preferred answer, and then we'll take a look at the solution. All right, let's uh, begin looking at the solution then. So once again, we're gonna sort of anticipate uh, what the answer choice is that's correct. Uh, you'll remember, I hope that a type two error has to do with failing to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is actually true or correct. So what would that mean here? That would mean the patient actually does have arthritis, but when the doctor uses the diagnostic test, they don't figure that out. So they don't conclude that the patient has arthritis. They think the patient doesn't. And unfortunately, that means that they would not prescribe the treatment that the patient needs. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the options. So we need something where the doctor doesn't figure out that the patient has arthritis and therefore doesn't diagnose. So let's look at A. Diagnosing arthritis in a patient who has arthritis, well, that's actually not a mistake. Okay, so answer choice A is not an error. Um, answer choice B, failing to diagnose arthritis in a patient who has arthritis, that's right. That's, that's the type two error. Choice C, diagnosing arthritis in a patient who does not have arthritis, that's a type one error which is rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. So it's not that one. Uh, D is a correct decision, failing to diagnose arthritis in a patient who does not have arthritis. That's not a mistake, the doctor got it right. And E is some made up answer choice, prescribing treatment to a patient regardless of the diagnosis. That means sometimes the doctor would be right and sometimes the doctor would be wrong, but we wouldn't know if it was an error or not in that case. So it looks like uh, the only answer choice that makes sense here is answer choice B. So let's take a look how uh, folks did. Quite well on this one, actually. Uh, answer choice B was selected by 81% about of the people uh, who, who participated. So that, that's fantastic, well done. A lot of students do reverse these. So uh, I'm glad that such a high percentage uh, were able to get that right. We are rolling now. Let's head on to question number three. We have a new response link uh, in the handout or out on the tiny URL site listed at the bottom of the slide. So let's read actively. A botanist collected one leaf at random from each of 10 randomly selected mature maple trees. 
Okay, so we've selected 10 maple trees at random, and then we've selected a leaf at random from each of those trees. That's a lot of randomness going on. Uh, but, and the mature maple trees are of the same species. So 10 randomly selected mature maple trees. The mean and the standard deviation of the surface areas for the 10 leaves in the sample were, uh, were measured. Assume the distribution of surface areas of maple leaves is normal. Okay. What is the appropriate method for constructing a one sample confidence interval to estimate the population mean surface area of the species of maple leaves and why is the method appropriate? As usual, my pause, uh, I'm gonna read through the answer choices, but I wanna give you another plug to please lock in your best answer when you're ready to do so. Here are the answer choices for why uh, we want to pick a particular method. So choice A, the T interval is appropriate because the population standard deviation is not known. Choice B, the T interval is appropriate because the T interval is narrower than the Z interval. Choice C, the Z interval is appropriate because the Z interval is narrower than the T interval. Choice D, the Z interval is appropriate because the central limit theorem applies. And choice E, the Z interval is appropriate because the sample standard deviation is known. I'm gonna pause for just a few seconds to let uh, everybody else lock in their answers and then we'll see how you did. All right, so I'm gonna move on over to uh, start looking at the solution slide. So our goal here is to estimate the population mean. And we've done a random sample of 10 uh, maple trees and randomly chosen one leaf off of each of those trees and measured the surface area and calculated the mean and standard deviation from that sample of data. Well, one of the key facts we need here is that when the population standard deviation sigma is unknown, the appropriate confidence interval method is a one sample T interval when we're estimating a population mean. Because sigma is unknown, that is why we have to use a T interval instead of some other method. So that narrows it down a little bit, doesn't it? That wipes out choices C, D, and E. Now, the Z interval is what Mr. Wilcox showed you in the previous session when you're doing inference about a population proportion or a difference between two proportions, uh, that would be where the Z interval would be appropriate. Or in the mystical case where we somehow knew the population standard deviation and we're trying to do uh, some kind of uh, calculation involving a mean. So we're down to A or B, and I think I've probably given it away in my remarks there. Uh, it looks like choice A, the T interval is appropriate because the population standard deviation is not known. That's why. Uh, B is a true statement in that the T interval is, oh, actually the first part is. The second part is definitely not true. The T interval is gonna be wider than the Z interval because the T critical value that you multiply by is gonna be much larger than the Z critical value. How do we do on this one? Well, this is more of a, what are you supposed to do kind of question. So we'll see how that, uh, how that went. As you can see, uh, about 66.5% uh, of the respondents picked answer choice A, about two thirds, fantastic. Uh, your teachers would be very pleased to see that. And I am also very pleased. Well, we're cooking with gas now. So we, uh, we're ready to head on to our fourth and final multiple choice question. And this one uh, is involving inference about slope. Uh, we also have some computer output so we can get back to one of those requests from students in the feedback form. Reminder to uh, include your answer via the response link on the session for handout or the tiny URL at the bottom of the slide here. Got a lot of reading to do and then we have some computer output to look at. So here we go. Scientists have long believed that linear regression could be used to predict the brain weight of non-human mammals from the body weight. In one study, body weight in kilograms and brain weight in grams, sorry, things delayed there, uh, of 22 non-human mammals were measured. 
a linear regression analysis was performed yielding the output below. So you can see here, we have regression analysis, brain weight versus body weight, N equals 22 was the sample size. And then we have a bunch of information here on the computer output. So as you take a look at the computer output, what are we gonna to need to do with it? Assuming that all conditions for inference are met, which of the following expressions represents a 95% confidence interval for the slope of the least squares regression line? 95% confidence interval for the slope. Okay, so uh, this is my reminder to pause myself. We've read through the options and I wanna give you a few seconds to lock in your uh, best answer choice. Now I suspect this one will go a little bit slower because you have to look at the output and then make a decision about which one is the confidence interval for slope. And I also suspect that quite a number of classes have not gotten to this topic yet. So that would also slow people down a lot. And that's okay if you haven't gotten there yet, then this is uh, one you can come back and look at uh, once your class has done inference about slope. Well, with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and start over to the solution slide and we can mark up the computer output just a little bit while we're giving people time to answer. Uh, so we need a confidence interval for the slope. We're told to assume the conditions are met and I'm just gonna uh, pick a nice ink color here to mark things up. Um, first of all, we can check the formula sheet to see if there's anything helpful uh, that we might wanna use for the confidence interval for the slope. And you'll remember that on the formula sheet, all of the inference information uh, as far as formulas, besides the generic confidence interval formula that you see here, will be over on page two. So confidence interval for slope, that's gonna be way down at the bottom, sampling distributions for simple linear regression. And you see the random variable here is the slope and the parameters of the sampling distribution are given and so is the standard error of the sample statistic. But as it turns out, the computer output gives us everything we need. So we don't need to build the interval like Mr. Wilcox did from scratch yesterday. We actually just need the generic formula for a confidence interval that he showed several times, statistic plus or minus critical value times standard error of statistic. All of the information except the critical value is given on the computer output. So what do we need from the computer output? Well, we need the slope. That's what we've got uh, here, there's our slope. So the slope of the sample regression line is 1.096. Um, we're also gonna need to know the standard error of the slope. Uh, by the way, the slope is 1.096 and that's gonna be our uh, midpoint of our interval. So we can rule out 68.688, that's the y-intercept up there. So we don't wanna use the y-intercept uh, when doing inference about the slope. Uh, the standard error of the slope is here. I'll just write that as SE sub B for standard error of slope. And that's the number we're gonna need to put into our formula as we do 1.096 plus or minus some critical value times the standard error of the slope, 0 0.1308. And all we need now is the critical value. Well. This one's pretty easy because all the critical values are the same. They've been nice to us here. And they really just wanna see if we know what to do from the computer output to get the confidence interval. So 2.086 is the correct um, critical value. Now, if you're wondering where that came from, uh, we can pop over to the calculator for just a second. And let me clear off of here. Uh, we can go to the distributions menu and we can find a T critical value using inverse T uh, we want a 95% confidence interval. So that means we want 95% in the middle, two and a half percent on each tail. So the area to the left of the place we want, we can uh, choose 0.975 to the left. The degrees of freedom for inference about slope is the sample size minus two. So that would be 20. So our critical value 2.086. Again, if your class hasn't covered this yet, then come back and take a look later and it'll make more sense. So that's where the 2.086 number came from. Of course, you could use the table, but you know me, I'm sort of a modern guy. I like to use the technology. So where have we got uh, with our solution? I think I think I see it over there as answer choice uh, A, I'm looking, yes. Uh, B has the wrong standard error. 
uh, 103.995, and D definitely has the wrong standard error. They're pulling that from the standard deviation of the residuals uh, down here. That's the standard deviation of the residuals. It's not the standard error of the slope. Uh, so we're definitely looking for answer choice A. We don't want C because that divides by uh, the standard, the square root of 22. That's not part of the formula. The standard error is just 0 0.1308. How did we do? This was a tough question, and it's the very last unit of the course uh, inference about slope. Uh, I'm looking over at my screen here. Actually, uh, not too terrible, uh, considering. Uh, it looks like we had about 49% uh, to get it correct. Uh, so given all the information I just said, I think that's fantastic. All right, well, we've done four good multiple choice questions here. We've done a little bit of review of computer output. More to come in uh, session six. Uh, but for now, we need to get on to our free response question for the day because it's a juicy one. So this free response question is kind of a typical significance test problem from a previous AP exam. Let me read uh, the question to you. High cholesterol levels in people can be reduced by exercise, diet, and medication. 20 middle-aged males with cholesterol readings between 220 and 240 milligrams per deciliter of blood were randomly selected from the population of such male patients at a large local hospital. 10 of the 20 males were randomly assigned to group A, advised on appropriate exercise and diet, and also received a placebo. The other 10 males were assigned to group B, received the same advice on appropriate exercise and diet, but received a drug intended to reduce cholesterol instead of a placebo. So one group's getting exercise and diet advice and a placebo, the other group's getting exercise and diet advice and a drug that's hopefully, hopefully gonna reduce their cholesterol. After three months, post-treatment cholesterol readings were taken for all 20 males and compared to pre-treatment cholesterol readings. The tables below give the reduction in cholesterol level, which I've underlined, pre-treatment reading minus post-treatment reading. So you're hoping it's going to go uh, down, which means you're hoping for a positive number there. Right? If your pretreatment reading for cholesterol is higher and you subtract the lower post-treatment reading, that means it went down, so you get a positive number. Um, so you see the data, group A is the placebo group. Here are the values for that group of 10 males. And here's group B, the cholesterol drug group. There are the 10 values. We also have the mean and the standard deviation provided below the data. So important to notice that. Uh, do the data provide convincing evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.01 level that the cholesterol drug is effective in producing a reduction in mean cholesterol level beyond that produced by exercise and diet because both groups were advised on exercise and diet, okay? So this is a really typical setup for a significance testing question. And we're gonna go through the entire process now and do a little bit of work on our calculator along the way. So here it goes. First thing we wanna do in a significance test is to state our hypotheses. We also wanna be sure to define any parameters that we use in our hypotheses if we use symbols and give the significance level just to remind us what our threshold is for finding statistical significance. Another question we need to establish here because we've got quantitative data and we wanna do inference about uh, means, is this inference about a mean difference where we have paired data, or is it inference about a difference in means where we have two samples or groups? Well, if you think about the design of the study, one group was randomly assigned to receive placebo on top of their advice on exercise and diet, and the other group was randomly assigned to receive the drug plus the advice on exercise and diet. So these are two distinct groups in a randomized experiment, which makes this inference about a difference in means from two samples. And as a result, our hypotheses should reflect the fact that we're doing inference about a difference in means. So one way to write the hypotheses would be null hypothesis mu sub a minus mu sub b equals zero. And the alternative mu sub a minus mu sub b would be less than zero because we wanna find out if there's evidence that the cholesterol drug is effective in producing a reduction in the mean cholesterol level beyond what we get from just the exercise and diet with a placebo. So that would mean that mu sub b is the bigger number. Or you could write it as null hypothesis mu sub a equals mu sub b. And the alternative is that the mean reduction 
due to placebo uh, for patients like these would be less than mu sub b, the true mean reduction for patients like these who take the cholesterol drug. So you're hearing me start to talk about the parameters. What are the parameters? Mu sub a is the mean cholesterol reduction if all such male patients at this hospital are advised on appropriate exercise and diet and also received a placebo. Mu sub b is the mean cholesterol reduction if all such male patients at this hospital are advised on appropriate exercise and diet and also received the drug. I used the subscripts A and B to match the group names. Um, you could conceivably have also used P for placebo and D for drug. It's a nice idea to use those contextual symbols so that the reader of your exam paper is not confused by your references, say to A or B in this case, or uh, P for placebo and D for drug. But you still need to clearly define the parameters regardless of your uh, notation that you're using. Uh, so there's no question about it. You'll remember in the stem of the problem, I hope, I know it's been a while ago, but they randomly selected patients and then randomly assigned them also. So this is kind of unusual in a, a statistical study to randomly select patients and then randomly assign them, but that's what they did. So that affects our scope of inference uh, to be able to infer to the population of all such patients at the hospital and also to draw a conclusion about cause and effect at the end of the study because they did random assignment to the treatment groups. The last thing I wanted to state was the significance level, which is alpha equals 0 0.01. So we've kind of gotten through that first uh, part. Now let's move along to the next part. We want to identify our inference procedure by name or by formula. One of those two is required uh, in order to get full credit. And then once we've identified the inference procedure, we need to verify that the conditions for doing that procedure are met. So the name of this procedure for comparing the two means and doing a test uh, is a two sample T test for a difference of means. That's the long name. When I use the calculator, you'll see the shorter name in a moment. So two sample T test for a difference of means is one way to identify the procedure. Uh, you could use the calculator name as well, or you could show the formula uh, that you're going to use to calculate it as the identification. Why a t-test? Well, because we don't know the true standard deviations uh, for either of these two populations of placebo-taking uh, men at the hospital who have this condition or cholesterol drug-taking type men at the hospital who have the condition. So the first condition is we need random data production of the appropriate type. And because this is a randomized experiment, we need to be sure we have random assignment to the treatments. And we do. It says that the 10 subjects were each randomly assigned to either group A or group B. And we need to also know that both sample sizes are either large enough, that would be say 30 or more, or we need to be willing to believe that the true distribution of reduction in cholesterol for each of these two populations is approximately normal. Well, we have both sample sizes only being 10, so we don't have large sample sizes, which means we have to look at the data to see if we're willing to believe that the corresponding populations from which they came are approximately normally distributed. So this is the time to go to our calculator to do that analysis. And if you were watching me earlier, uh, I had plugged in data into my calculator before the session for the two groups. So I typed that into my stat editor, and then I went into my statistics plot or stat plot and set up graphs with box plots for the two data sets. Uh, box plots are sort of an easy graph to look at when you want to determine if there are any outliers or any strong skewness. So these are the box plots for the two groups. Uh, if I hit trace, I can see this is uh, group one, which is group A in our uh, handout, and this is group two. Now. I don't see any outliers, which is good because with a sample size of 10, we would uh, not meet the condition to proceed. And I don't see any super strong skewness. I do see some evidence of skewness a little bit uh, skewed to the right. The right half of the box plot from the median up is more stretched out than the left half. Uh, conversely down here, the right half is less stretched out than the left half. So I see some evidence of left skewness, but not strong skewness. Uh, strong skewness would be if you imagine sort of the distribution of CEO salaries or something. The other good news for you is when the AP exam in a free response question asks you to construct a confidence interval or to perform a significance test, the conditions will be met. It's just a matter of you 
verifying with evidence. So I've looked at the calculator, but I need to write something on my paper. So this, this was my attempt to sort of sketch what I might draw on the paper real fast during the AP exam, a sketch of those box plots. Uh, with some, Now I need some kind of comment to go with it, something like neither distribution shows strong skewness or outliers. Uh, if, and if you really know what you're talking about, you can then go on and say, so we're willing to believe that the population distributions are both approximately normally distributed or that the uh, normal uh, assumption is believable. In any case, we've checked those two conditions uh, because this is a randomized experiment. We're not too worried about uh, checking conditions for sampling uh, from a larger population like the 10% condition. Uh, if you did check it because they did do random sampling here, it wouldn't be incorrect in this case. Uh, but in most randomized experiments, there is no random sampling. So it would, it would, it would normally be incorrect uh, to uh, check about 10% when you're sampling without replacement uh, in most experiments. So let's move on to the calculation part. Uh, we're going to need to calculate the test statistic and the p-value in order to get full credit for calculations. So I'm thinking technology. Um, there is a formula for that, but uh, there's also a stat test menu feature that would be just perfect. And here's another way to name the procedure that's a little less nice than uh, the two sample t-test for a difference of means that I gave earlier. Just two sample t-test would do it. Uh, that's certainly the correct name. And then I've inputted the data in list one and list two. Um, my alternative hypothesis was mu one less than mu two. Um, we don't pool uh, for difference of means in AP statistics. It's something you might do in a future stats course, but uh, we don't do it in AP stats. Uh, that would be assuming that the two population standard deviations were equal, and we don't want to make assumptions like that. Uh, the last thing I'm going to do is calculate. So I get a test statistic of negative 1.618 for T and a p-value of 0 0.062, let's say, with degrees of freedom about 17.3, uh, fractional degrees of freedom for two sample T procedure. So here are my screens again, uh, just so we've got that. So we need to give our test statistic T equals negative 1.618 and our p-value using what degree of freedom we did it with. So p-value 0.0619 with degrees of freedom being about 17.3. That's all we need to write down, uh, full credit for the calculations. If you want to grind out some formulas, uh, you can certainly do that. You can do the difference in the sample means divided by the standard error of the difference in the means. Where did I get those? Well, I bet you guessed the, uh, sorry, the uh, formula sheet there. Uh, so for the formula sheet, we could scroll down to uh, sampling distribution for difference of means. There's the formula for the standard error that you'll see in the denominator of the formula there. So we could do that, but honestly, on the AP exam, time is short and I want to be sure I get it right. So I'm probably going to use the calculator on a free response question. A multiple choice question might ask to see if you know how to use that formula. So don't discount the formulas, uh, but I'm just saying on the uh, free response questions with inference, I think I'd be tempted to do it with the calculator. That is my recommendation. So our final step here is going to be to uh, draw a conclusion based on the p-value and our uh, computed, uh, sorry, our stated significance level. So here we go. Because the p-value of 0 0.0619 is greater than alpha equals 0 0.01, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The data do not, sorry, hit that wrong button. The data do not provide convincing evidence that the cholesterol drug is effective and producing a mean cholesterol reduction beyond that provided by exercise and diet. So you've seen the entire, what I call four-step process, stating the hypotheses, identifying procedure and checking conditions, performing calculations, and then drawing the conclusion in context. That's a pretty good recipe for success when you're doing a significance test uh, on the AP statistics free response section. So let's do a little recap here. Uh, here at the end of session four. That was a lot of content on inference for quantitative data. So what am I hoping you will take away from this session? Well, uh, I also wanted to give a reminder here before I dig into my uh, bulleted list. Um, I'm also going to ask you to provide me with some feedback uh, at the end of the session. Uh, so there's the tiny URL address. So what did we simplify for you? Well, I hope we simplified how to interpret the confidence level 
uh, interpreting the confidence interval would be much more enjoyable, something you've practiced a lot. But I'm say 90% confident you're going to be asked to and to interpret, sorry, the confidence level somewhere on the AP exam this year. We talked about describing type one and type two errors in context. Uh, Mr. Wilcox talked about the power of a test yesterday. We also discussed why you use a T distribution when performing inference about means. And we looked a little bit at reading the computer output from a linear regression analysis. We'll do more with that in session six. A few strategies along the way to hopefully promote your AP exam success. Uh, continuing to read questions actively, anticipating that answer on multiple choice questions. That'll help you get some of the wrong answers out of the way many times. Knowing your formula sheet, not only what's on there, but when you personally are comfortable using it versus the calculator. And then using that technology wisely, especially on the free response questions uh, when you're doing inference and on the multiple choice where nobody is really watching what method you're using. And my advice after watching Mr. Wilcox in session three and me in session four is to follow the inference process whenever you're doing a confidence interval on a significance or a significance test on a free response question. Now, I certainly hope we've uh, built your confidence uh, in terms of inference for quantitative data. And in these previous two sessions in terms of doing inference period, whether it's about categorical data, doing inference about proportions or inference using chi-square, or today inference for quantitative data, whether you're doing inference about means or inference about slopes. So in terms of feedback from you, uh, two things I'd request. One, if you got something out of this session, felt it was beneficial, uh, maybe give us a thumbs up on YouTube so that we can get a lot more statistics students to join us for sessions five through eight, uh, which will focus uh, even more specifically on the AP exam. And the second is if you could uh, give me some feedback on that tiny URL form uh, that's there on the slide, that would be helpful for me as I'm looking ahead to session six. Uh, and I promise to uh, uh, look at your feedback before making my final plans for that session. So before I send you off, uh, let me mention that session five will be Mr. Wilcox giving you a close look at three, three important tools for the test. And uh, one of them, I'll give a little sneak peek uh, from our title description, one of them is definitely going to be your calculator. So for those of you who've requested a little bit more on the calculator, I know you'll want to uh, tune in for that. Uh, I will see you again for session number six, where we will dive deep into rubrics for free response success, looking at some uh, old free response questions like Mr. Wilcox and I have been doing along the way. So thank you so much for taking your time today to, uh, to join me. And uh, I hope you'll come back for, uh, for another session. Uh, take care until then.